for making this trip possible. And thank you, Michael, for working with me on this. Uh, so you might have been all very sad that Michael went to the UK. Well, I was very happy. <laughs> so the result of one of the many results of this day in the United Kingdom was the collaboration on this paper, which I think would have been possible even if you had been in Australia, because most of it went via email. I never been to Manchester to work in uh, Canterbury, though but related to our two presentation. So this paper is not specifically on the willingness to pay for the organic label only, which most of the papers that I know are on, but it is about the willingness to pay for organic attributes. And I'm going to show you soon what I mean by organic attributes. And the way I would like to proceed is the following. First, I would like to try to motivate you a bit, to show you why it is important, and I think it is interesting to refer to the contributions that we make to the literature. Um, I will not speak too much about the church experiment design, and if you have questions, you have to ask Michael, because he has performed the design, but I will say some words about it. I will present you the survey instrument, because this is a church experiment, or one of the most important part of it is the survey instrument, and I will present you some descriptive statistics about the data that we have that is supposed to be representative. So normally when you buy data and pay money, the company assures you it's going to be representative, and then you go and check and it is not. So I'm going to speak about that and how we try to get along with the issues that we have. Unfortunately, I could not cut back the methodology section more than five slides, so I, I would like you to bear with me for those five slides. Um, sorry for that, it was not possible to make it shorter. And then finally, I'm going to present you part of the results. So we have two products that we are looking at. One is chicken breast and the other one are carrots to represent one category which is a maybe mostly associated with organic produce, carrots. Um, even though the most consumed proved to be dairy, in the end, people, the most bought organic product is milk, see, at least in the UK, but associated with organic usually is produce, so we have carrots to represent produce, but also we have meat, chicken breast, um, to be represented by the lost, least bought category in organic. So we have two products from these two categories, and we have the results from the choice experiment, so it's dated, and we had something that I like to call revealed preference data, but I was uh, corrected by the referee recently because it's not really revealed, it's recalled. So we asked the consumers what they have bought in the last month. So it's what they recall that they have bought, which is often done in the literature. Why? Because even though this very beautiful data sets exist, like the ones provided by AC Nielsen and Kanta, where they scan whatever people buy. The problem with those data sets is that they are very expensive. So most people cannot afford them. So uh, this was the cheaper way to get along, to ask the people who participated in the choice experiment also about their purchases in the last month. So what I'm going to sometimes maybe incorrectly refer to as reveal data, maybe try to keep in mind is recalled purchases over the last month, and I'm going to present some data about that as well <coughs> to conclude. So why do I think that this is, we think that this is important? First of all, as I have already mentioned, even though there are studies looking at the willingness to pay for the organic label, uh, to my knowledge, I think to our knowledge, there is no uh, other study in the UK looking at organic attributes, with one exception that I found out about at the Agriculture Human Society Conference in April, and that study comes from New Zealand, uh, your neighbors, and their focus is not necessarily on the UK. They are looking at what consumers are willing to pay uh, for food, which attributes are most interesting for them in order to perform trade uh, uh, agreements with with five specific countries, one uh, among which is the United Kingdom. So they have a completely different focus, and the attributes are a bit differently labeled, but that one is the closest that I know 
that comes from our study. So there is no other study that we know that looks at this specific organic attribute, even though, as I mentioned, the organic label per se and the willingness to pay for it has been researched before. So why is this important and interesting to be analyzed? Well, because there is a bit of a puzzle in the United Kingdom. The demand for conventional food is decreasing. Why that is happening? The demand for organic food is on the rise. So according to the Soil Association, 7.1% increase in 2016. But this might not seem surprising because organic demand is increasing worldwide, as we all know. But what is puzzling is that at the same time, the organically farmed area in the UK is decreasing the sixth year in a row. So while people demand more organic products, uh, the production of organic uh, food is decreasing in the UK. I'm not going to go into details why this is happening, but it is interesting because there might be missing uh, opportunities for the UK, both from economic point of view, but also from environmental point of view. And at this time, I think the study is uh, especially timely because uh, the United Kingdom has the prospect to exit the common agricultural policy of the um, European Union and has the opportunity to redesign their own uh, agriculture policy. And therefore, they might set an eye or put a focus on organic production and uh, might be interested on which organic attributes are most valued by the UK consumer. So it might be interesting for producers if they want to come back or remain into organic production on which attributes they should put their focus in production because those are the attributes which are most valued by the consumers. It might be interesting for retailers if they wish and are allowed to advertise organic products, which attributes they should focus <coughs> mostly in their advertisement. And it might be of interest to bodies such as the Organic Trade Board, which has recently received an enormous sum of money in order to promote <coughs> organic products in the UK and in Denmark, also in the UK. So they might be interested in uh, which attributes are most interesting to promote organic products. The study could be also used for welfare analysis to estimate the economic value derived from changes in various attributes for organic products, from developing maybe new products with these attributes and potentially their profitability. And it can inform the government about the household uh, valuation of agriculture and environmental policies. And as I said, this is extremely important at this point in time where there might be the scope of a redesign of the agriculture policy in the United States. So we think it's timely, it has not been done before, and it's very interesting. I hope I try to motivate you a bit from an economic point of view, but also from a methodological point of view, I think that we are contributing because, as you, I'm sure, are aware of, the strongest criticism brought to face of my first method is the hypothetical bias associated with the hypothetical nature of, uh, of the survey. And we are trying to address this in two ways. So we have um, two ex post ex-ante mechani mechanisms by which we try to correct for that. We call them hypothetical bias treatments. I'm quite sure that you have heard about cheap talk and a budget constraint reminder. If not, I'm going to speak about it a bit later on. The second mechanism is called honesty priming. And so uh, we have various settings. So I call hypothetical bias treatment one you will see that in the results, and that's why I wanted to remind you already here, cheap talk plus budget constraint reminder and the honesty priming. So all three of them refer to the first treatment. The second treatment contains cheap talk and budget constraint reminder. The third treatment is just honesty priming, and the fourth one is the baseline containing no treatment at all. So this is the ex ante way in which we try to correct for hypothetical bias treatment. You are going to see that they work, even though there are many studies that are critical about these uh, treatments. Some of them find them to be 
working and useful. Many of them find them not to work. Uh, in our case, they do have a significant impact, so they seem to work. And what we also have, and what was in fact the starting point of this whole study, but turned out to be not so important in the end, is that we have this recalled or revealed data by which we try to validate the stated result. And we are going to see, yes, we do find that some consistency between the stated and revealed preferences. However, I have to say from the beginning, in all honesty, that because it is recalled data and not truly revealed data, it might suffer in a similar manner from hypothetical bias as the stated data. They might just variate together. <coughs> that might be the reason why they are correlated. So I'm honest and I'm saying that from the beginning. The reason why <coughs> we couldn't perform a joint estimation as, as it was originally aimed at is because the way the attributes were collected and revealed data wasn't matching perfectly with the one in the stated data. So I'm going to take care that in future we are doing that better. But you have to understand, and that we also have to keep in mind when we are going to perform the next step, that it's very hard to collect revealed data on many attributes. Because people get very bored when they have to fill in you know, whatever they have bought with every price, with all the characteristics that they need to fill in. I know because uh, previously to this study, I have performed a pilot in Canterbury, sitting on the street in front of the supermarket, asking people, and they were getting extremely bored at the revealed part. Now, the stated part, it's a bit more fun, even though there are many questions into it, but they seem to like it more. But the revealed part was very cumbersome, and that was the reason why originally I didn't put too many attributes in the, in the revealed part. So, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, please. <laughs> I have no idea what model she's trying to use. I'm going to speak about it. <laughs> I thought you might not. Yeah. But I'm going to speak about it. But I'm also going not to keep you too much in suspense. I'm going to reveal you already the results. So even though I started with this big aim about organic, uh, what the results in fact show, yes, we have a core of organic consumers, organic lovers, which is about 20 to 30 percent of the consumers. So they are willing to pay for the organic label in both cases, for carrots and for um, for chicken. However, consumers reveal to be willing to pay more for other attributes, specifically environmentally friendly production for chicken and low chemical usage for carrots. But most importantly, for both products, uh, the attribute quality reveals to be the most important one, the one who is most valued by the consumers. And interestingly enough, <coughs> the study from New Zealand that I have mentioned before also has as a result that the willingness to pay is highest in the UK for the attribute quality. And the other studies that I have also sp spoken about by Griffith and Nesheim, they do not estimate a willingness to pay, but they ask consumers to rank the various attributes. And in their rank in the UK, as well, the attribute quality is the most valid one. And believe me that I found out about these studies only after I had my results. I was not influenced by them. I wouldn't have wanted to be influenced by them because my original aim was to find the highest willingness to pay for organic, which I didn't. Yeah? So, um, but still, consumers are interested in uh, environmental attributes. And I think that this is an important result. And this is something that can be used for policy further on. So now I'm coming to a question that Marit asked. So this hypothetical bias treatment, uh, the first one, cheap talk, is really cheap talk. It's very simple. You just tell consumers that, in general, there is this tendency for not behaving in the same manner in a real situation as in a hypothetical situation. Uh, I think that even the word overstatement might be in, no, it's just that the people behave different. So you warn the consumer that this bias normally exists, and you urge the consumer to behave in the same way as they would behave if they would be in front of the shelf in the supermarket. Yeah? So this is cheap talk. At the same time, one of the problems with this condition variation studies is that um, people are not, uh, do not remember that they have to make trade-offs. In a trade-off, 
they always have to make trade-offs. But nevertheless, we remind them again that if they spend more money on a product, they will have less money to buy other goods, which might not be necessarily related to food. Yeah? So it's important to remind them. And studies have shown that this is working. Yes, there are studies that don't show that it doesn't, but it seems to be that the evidence is more in favor that when people are reminded about that general bias, their overestimation, because in general they're overestimated, tends to be lower. And this honesty priming is very simple. Uh, consumers, before filling in the willingness to pay task, answering the willingness to pay cash, they are trying to be primed into answer truthfully. So they have to fill in, for example, the earth is, they could insert either round or flat. So hopefully they will insert it as round. Uh, and then, for example, another question is a set of 10 questions. I know this sounds very simple. Uh, this is dot, 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 uh, either a true or a choice story. So the obviously the correct answer is the true. So they, they are forced more or less to give some truthful answers to 10 questions in the hope that they are primed in answer truthfully and then they are going to answer truthfully later on also in the willingness to pay question. Into our results, in fact, as you are going to see, this one is not working as well as the other one, the cheap talk. The cheap talk seems to be working better, this one. But it, it's one of the mechanisms. In future, we might think about this first evaluation. I have read, read recently that uh, if you ask people, for example, what they think their neighbor would want to pay, they do not have this social desirability bias or a warm glow from you know, what the neighbor is going to pay, and then they answer more truthfully. However, it is quite difficult to make them estimate what the neighbor would pay. But we might want to think in future to, to use another mechanism. But these seem to be simple and relatively easy to implement, and that's why I've chosen them for this study, and they were effective. I mean, they were significant, not for everybody, not in every class, but they had a significant impact. In uh, they helped in positioning platforms for that. So we address four strands of literature that I'm just going to remind you about. The first one is about revealed preference literature, where actual choices made by consumers in supermarkets are the basis for the analysis. However, the problem with the revealed preference literature is that it cannot estimate willingness to pay for the so-called credence attributes or non-use attributes, attributes from which the consumer does not di derive a direct utility, like, for example, better taste. The better taste is the use value because it tastes better, I derive utility from it. But if you ask consumers about environmental friendliness, yeah, it's not really a direct use that they have from that attribute. So this is a so-called non-use value or credence value. The classical one are existence option or bequest value, so where people just derive utility because good exists or they can bequest them to their, uh, their children. Um, so they are not of direct use. But, but in case of the organic, this non-use attribute seems to be a multitude of animal welfare. There are studies who even find altruistic value they find so-called vicarious value, which is deriving utility from just reading in the newspaper about organic products. So organic products seem to have a, a large variety of non-use values attributes, and this, these cannot be captured by revealed preference methods. Moreover, revealed preference methods suffer from multicollinearity between the attributes if they are many. So it's very hard to disentangle the willingness to pay for it specific attributes, and therefore we try to overcome this by using this, the stated preference method where consumers ask about their willingness to pay in a hypothetical situation, and they state what they want to pay um, in a non-real situation, I'm sure all of you know about them, and the advantage of this method is that you can capture this credence attributes or non-use attributes, the, the willingness to pay for them, can disentangle it for each one of them very well, as opposed to the revealed preference method. And moreover, you could even define attributes which are not existing in reality yet, in order to define new products with those attributes. So it's a very powerful ma method and very useful, especially for organic products, again, because organic products have this variety of non-use values that we can 
uh, addressed with this method. However, as we all know, the strongest criticism brought to this literature is the hypothetical bias uh, associated with stated preference, and therefore we also address the hypothetical bias literature. The uh, in first violation story I heard I read from the Loomis paper 2014, very good paper that I highly recommend, even though it was designed by Norwood and Lusk. They have three papers on, on that, and it's very interesting. So there are methods to deal with this hypothetical bias, which in general, the ratio between stated and revealed is considered to be two to three. So people think that people in general uh, states to want to pay two or three times more than what they really reveal to pay in reality. But if you look at this literature, in fact, all the meta-analysis find a factor of 1.5. So it's about 1.5 times more on average what people state they want to pay as compared to what they really pay. There are some studies who even show a negative one, so stated are less than real, but in general, this is about 1.5. And there are various methods, as I already mentioned, to deal with this hypothetical bias, which are ex ante, before you ask the witness to pay the question, you try to induce consumers to ask, answer truthfully. From oath, uh, solemn oath, you make people swear that they are going to answer truthfully uh, to, I don't know, Bayesian truth serum, which is very similar, in fact, to this inferred valuation question. These are ex ante, but there are also mo methods to deal exposed, like uh, validating your results with revealed data for the external valuation, or even real experiments. Of course, if we could afford to perform a real experiment where we would have the product and we would ask consumers to actually pay for them, then probably this would come closest to actual behavior. However, performing a real experiment with food is very difficult because you have to get the agreement from all these bodies that you have to store the food. And it is very expensive. I mean, even that was too expensive for my budget. So uh, unfortunately, this is not very easy to perform. But there are these methods out there that try to deal with hypothetical bias. And we are trying to apply both an ex ante and ex post mechanism to correct for this hypothetical bias. And by this, even though we started wanting to perform a joint estimation where we pull together the stated and revealed data, and we found out in the end that we cannot because the attributes were not perfectly matching between the stated and revealed data. We do use the revealed data in order to improve the choice experiment. Why? Because we choose, for example, the attribute levels in the choice experiment design based on the revealed data, and also we perform a pilot uh, before the actual choice experiment, and we use the, the data from the pilot in order to set priors in the choice experiment design. So we do enrich the choice experiment, the stated data, with the revealed data. And moreover, we perform this type of validation in the end. So we address also uh, this kind of literature in a way. So this is a card showing the seven attributes that we are considering for chicken. Uh, for carrots, there will be, there will be no animal welfare, obviously, because there's no animal welfare in for, for carrots. So what are our attributes? We have the label, which can be organic or conventional. For the conventional, there is no label. But for organic, we have two, because the most frequent label in the United Kingdom is the soil association uh, certification. And consumers' studies have shown do not even know in the United Kingdom the European Union Organic label, how many of you knew the European organic label? This green stuff with the leaf? You don't know it either. I think in, in Australia it has another name. Isn't it organic? There is another logo used for organic. I don't know. Anyway, because they have the products there in the European Union, so they are marked by this label, but because they do not know it always, we also included this soil association label, which is most known to the consumer. We have six different levels for the prices where the first three correspond to actual paid um, prices in the supermarkets for conventional products, and the last three are actually paid prices in the supermarkets for organic uh, products. 
And the last price is considered to be a kind of chalk price where consumers might not be willing to pay. I mean, to pay 10 pounds for a 400 gram piece of chicken is indeed very expensive. And even I, who am a very fond of organic and very convinced about it, cannot afford and am not buying it. Yeah? But, but the price exists. Yeah? So this is a kind of chalk price. Then about chemical usage, and in general, the lower level is the average. It's not zero, but it is average. And then you have a better. You have two uh, dimensions, the dumping with zero, one, where zero, in fact, means the, the average level, and one is the better. In this case, chemical usage refers to, uh, in fact, low use of antibiotics or artificial pesticides. Uh, in the case of uh, environmentally friendly is uh, if we have a high, um, it is described for the consumer in the choice experiment, it means that it's a uh, very environmentally friendly uh, production like, you know, rotating crops and these methodologies. And this eco-friendly label is something which is very well known in the United Kingdom. Apparently it's a very well known label. Animal welfare <coughs> refers to the freedom food label because apparently the Freedom Food Label is again a label which is well known in the United Kingdom for high standard in animal welfare. Then quality, average, and premium, but I didn't call it premium, I, uh, we call it high. And the last attribute is referring to the expiry date. Even though it proves it relatively not to be very much the case, uh, there is a perceived feeling that uh, organic products might have a lower shelf life, a sooner expiry date, and therefore consumers might buy less because of that attribute. So we wanted to see uh, how consumers react to this attribute as well. Uh, if the product expires in less than one week, uh, they would find a sign with hurry up. While if the product expires in one week or longer, there is a sign here, you can use this product for one week or longer. In the end, it proved in the results that this attribute wasn't very significant. But it was important to look at it because if you think that, for example, you're a mother and you want to buy milk, if organic milk is expiring in two days and the other one keeps for one week, it might be a reason why you go for the conventional. So we thought that it might be interesting to look at that attribute as well. But in the end, it didn't prove to be highly significant. So these are the attributes. You can ask some questions about them if you wish. I yeah. just have one. Did, is organic a subset of premium food? So is it possible to have an organic chicken that doesn't make animal welfare? That is not freedom food. So these are attributes that are in general associated with organic but can exist independently of it as well. So you can have an organic product which has on the top of it a freedom food label. But it's more the other way, because you have one without the freedom food, you can't yes. imagine the, yes, the production. Consider to be equivalent or lower than freedom food, because freedom food is the highest standard of animal welfare possible to the UK, So it's unclear if they are equivalent, but freedom food claims that they are the best. So there are, I, I looked on our Freedom Food site, and unfortunately they are not out necessarily outside. They could be the chickens, but in a very big barn with natural light. So they have enough space to flap around their wings, and they have uh, hay to peck at it and to move around. So it is very <coughs> similar to, to going outside. Yeah? Uh, they claim even higher animal welfare than organic, where they have to be outside. So it's free range and outside, but, but maybe because they are safer and they can't be attacked by you know, predators or something like that. But anyway, this is the label which is considered to have the highest animal welfare in the UK. And uh, organic, uh, my personal opinion is as a higher one, but I think most people think it's comparable or maybe even less. So, other questions? Okay, I need to close up. Okay, this is a, a, an example of a choice cut for chicken. 
uh, consumers have option A, B, A, both of them are organic in this case, but option A has higher uh, environmentally friendly attributes um, and it's higher quality, it's now high frequent premium, okay? And it has a longer expiry date and it's also more expensive. But if the consumers do not want to choose either, and we have very often, especially in the case for chicken vegetarians, they have the option to choose no, none of them, option C, no choice, but then they have to give an explanation. So there is a cost for that. And they did. So we have many who chose the no option and they, they wrote because I'm vegetarian or something like that. So this is an example of a choice card. Oh, sorry, do you have some questions maybe? Okay, now I'm moving on. So the choice is primary design. If we would consider all the possible alternatives, there will be 192 for chicken and 96 for carrots less. Please remember, we don't have the animal welfare attributes for carrots. Uh, so too many, obviously people would not be able to answer that. Oops, wrong. Uh, so what we do then is that we employ this mean optimality where we minimize the D errors and then we reduce the choice sets to 32 per product. Uh, by doing that, we use the priors from the pilot, remember that. 32 is still too much. So what we further do is that we block the uh, choice in four sets of eight choices per product, plus a four level column as a factor in the design. And then we create, we make sure that these sets are approximately equivalent. So in the end, what the consumer is faced with from the multitude of choices that they had, so about 300, they are left with eight for chicken and eight for carrots, which is something that is done in the literature and <coughs> appears to be manageable. Oops. Yeah, I think that was it. If you have more questions about the design, you have to ask Michael. So um, the data was provided in this case where professionals, so I moved along from staying in front of supermarkets. I asked the professional company, I paid the professional company. It's the same company that also provides software for the survey instrument. Maybe you have heard about it, Qualtrics. But if you have ever order data from them, make sure it is uh, representative bef before you pay them. I didn't do that, so I couldn't go back. We had these 60 observations before from a pilot that we could use for the choice experiments design. In the end, we collected 500, and they collected 520, but only 505 proved to be valid. So 505 is the number that we use in our estimation. And we had a quite rich questionnaire consisting on this revealed preference part, the choice task that I have spoken about, and a very rich set of socioeconomic characteristics where additionally to the usual suspects like age and uh, uh, gender and uh, income which are associated with organic, we also have questions about attitudes towards organic and green products, health, happiness, and exercise, because these have been found usually in the literature to be correlated with organic consumption. In our case, they were very much correlated, but we wanted to check. So these are summary statistics for the data that we have. Uh, fortunately, income, which is the most important variable when found with respect to organic uh, purchases, is uh, statistically representative for the uh, average income in the United Kingdom, as is the number of children. However, we, uh, and then the sample consists of 60% women and 40% men because we wanted it to be like that, because reflecting that women are in general the ones who make the purchase in the household, not in mine, but in general they are. Um, in, unfortunately, the sample is not representative in terms of age, uh, and in terms of education, as is often found in, in this type of studies where our people are overeducated, it's about one year more than the average found by UNO for the, uh, for the United Kingdom, which would generally tend to an overestimation of the willingness to pay for organic products. However, age is overrepresented uh, as well because the average age in the United Kingdom is about 40 and here it is 50. And studies in general show that older people tend rather not to buy organic products. And it's also a result that we find in our study. So this would, in a way, counterbalance potentially the education effect. But moreover, what we are doing 
we try to correct for this potential non-representativeness by calculating all the variables as deviation from the true population mean, so the, from the true data from the Office of National Statistics. What's, what's your population? It would have to be people who are older than 16. So shouldn't you be taking the average age of that? Pardon? Adults? Shouldn't you be taking the average age of adults rather than the average age of the, pop the UK population? But, so it is after 18 and until 65. So it's cut between uh, 18 and 65. But unfortunately, the, the bit between 50 and 65 is much larger than it is in the population of the United Kingdom. Because older people have got less, more time on that. Probably they have more time to do the survey. So be careful because I reviewed a paper recently also using Qualtrics data and they seem to have a problem with that because the sample had the same problem. But we are calculating the variables as the deviations from the true population mean and therefore the coefficients of the attributes are giving should be giving the marginal utility of someone at the population average. So we try to correct for that. In future, we might try to use uh, weightings, but you know, this is for the moment how we try to correct for, the, for this non-representativeness in our sample. Uh, the methodology. So it's a typical random utility framework with the typical probability to make one choice with a typical indirect utility function where we try to express this in money metrics rather than utils, then uh, the probability to choose one alternative from all is given by this formula here, which I'm quite sure that all of you know. We use conditional logic and latent class model in order to estimate our models, and conditional logic seems to be especially suited where you have both uh, attributes of the product and characteristics of the individuals and the number of choices is large, which is uh, the case in our situation. And we also use latent class models where we try to group individuals in uh, homogeneous, in groups of homogeneous preferences and um, to see how uh, is, for example, the sample of organic bi uh, buyers constituted of. I still think that it's, it's a very important addition um, to this study. So. The class membership function can be uh, expressed by the expression below, and then you have the probability to belong to a specific class similarly as before, given by this expression. And then in the end, you can estimate the probability to both belong to a specific class and make a specific choice. And this is given by the equation here. Okay. And the number of classes I going to take this away in both cases was has proved to be five the optimal number of classes based on the Bayesian information criteria and also the judgment of the researcher as the literature suggests. Uh, what we have also employed here is attribute non-attendance because studies have shown that and in our case we have asked debriefing questions if they specifically have ignored some attributes and indeed, consumers seem to have ignored some attributes in their choices, and import, it is important to take this into consideration. And we have employed this attribute non-attendance methodology where the parameter of the specific attribute was set to zero in the utility function, uh, and this led to a better fit. So this was uh, the only reason why I put here the formula for the willingness to pay, which I'm sure that all of you know, is the ratio between the coefficient of the attribute and the coefficient of the price is, to re-emphasize that if the price is zero, we have a problem. So we cannot estimate the willingness to pay for the classes of people who have a price which is not significantly different from zero. So it is in principle zero. So we will not be looking at those classes. Moreover, we have a problem when the price is significantly positive because this would just mean that uh, people derive more utility from higher prices. So we are going to, unfortunately, need to ignore also those classes because, because we cannot meaningfully estimate their willingness to pay. So please bear this in mind when I'm going to show the results for the willingness to pay. Uh, we calculate the willingness to pay both per individual and per hypothetical bias treatment. And I'm going to show just one set of the many results that we have. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show the results just for chickens in order to save time. 
And these are the conditional logic results for chicken, where you can see that the attributes that had a significant impact on the choice of chicken are environmentally friendly production, the organic label, quality, and animal welfare. Obviously, chemical usage didn't have best before, didn't have a significant impact. Price has, as expected, a negative and significant impact. The SQ means choosing the no option. Of course, this impacts negatively on the choice if you take the no option um, choice. Uh, age, uh, older people do not like organic, as I have already mentioned before. That's why you can see here a negative coefficient of the interaction term between age and organic. Uh, people with high income do like organic as expected. People who are pro-organic as well as expected, so this is just a consistency proof. However, professionals don't. This has a negative coefficient. Women appreciate the higher animal welfare as vegetarians seem to do even though they might not buy chicken, but they might buy it for their family if they don't eat it themselves. People who are pro-organic uh, appreciate the environmentally friendly attributes in the choice of chicken, and they do not appreciate the best before, the, short, the longer expiry date. Unemployed people appreciate the higher quality when choosing chicken. Um, healthy people don't. Uh, women appreciate the higher quality, and there are several categories of people who appreciate or not the opt-out option. Vegetarians, as you can see, do very highly so because they might not be interested in chicken. So they choose the opt-out option. The in one interesting thing about this table that I would like you to keep in mind is that this interaction term between the price and the buy org dummy, which just shows that somebody had bought organic in the last month, has a positive and significant impact on the choice of chicken. No. Yeah, we ha I think we choose the just the significant one. Sorry, yes, the answer is yes. Yeah, there were many, many which were not. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we have these five classes. Class two loves organic. Class four hates organic. This consists about 30%, the other one 20%. Other people don't care about organic, other classes of people. What is interesting to note is, A, that the hypothetical bias treatment had overall a significant impact, and this is mainly due to the impact they had in class three, the organic haters. Yeah? And what is also important to find out, to keep in mind, is the fact that this dummy, the fact that people bought in the past, uh, in the past month, does have an impact on the class attendance in the class of organic lovers, which is reassuring because it means that there's a consistency there, as is the fact that they are pro-organic. And what you unfortunately have to keep in mind is that we won't be able to estimate the willingness to pay for the class of organic lovers because their price coefficient is not significantly different from zero. So we will have a severe underestimating of the willingness to pay for organic because we cannot estimate the willingness to pay for that class. The other class is, um, especially class five, is not so important because it consists of only four, five, uh, four percent of people, and the other two classes ignore the organic attributes, and all the classes appreciate the quality. You can see in all the classes, the quality attribute is highly significant, and this leads to the main results, the willingness to pay results, where we calculate the willingness to pay per hypothetical bias treatment, and we try to differentiate between treatment and no treatment and estimate hypothetical bias. Uh, we have to leave out class two of organic lovers because their price coefficient was not significantly different from zero, and class five because they had a positive coefficient. So the results are reflecting that. But what is most important to keep in mind from this big table, and I'm thinking you bear with, is that the highest average willingness to pay is for the attribute quality. So people seem to be willing to pay about one pound 60 more on average for per 400 gram pack to have a higher quality. And uh, the next highest one is for environmentally friendly production, 0 0.65 pounds or 65 cents per pack. People are willing to pay more in order to have more environmentally friendly production of chicken.
I have revealed descriptive statistics. I don't know how much time I have to speak. The price is higher, twice as high. Minus you have people who bought, sorry? Minus 10 minutes. Okay, sorry. I thought that, okay. Um, we have people who bought organic. The price is higher for organic. The quantity is about similar. The product expires sooner if they are organic. Um, there are more shop on brands in the conventional than in the organic. Most people bought at Tesco, which is the shop with the highest market share in the United Kingdom. We even have people who bought both organic chicken and carrot. These are 54, about 10% of the sample. So these are just uh, some descriptive statistics. What is important to keep in mind, and this is the one to last slide, so therefore you can be happy, is that um, this dummy that we had created from the revealed data which shows that people had bought organic in the last week uh, has a significant impact both in the c logit estimation and in the lap and class model models. So in the c logit they, it interacts with the price and impacts significantly on the choice of chicken and carrots. And in the Latin class model, it explains class attendance in the classes that appreciate the organic label. So uh, therefore, there is some consistency between the stated and the revealed results. So this seems in a way to validate the stated results. However, we have to keep in mind that this might be due to the fact that our revealed data is recalled data, so it's also stated if you wish, and therefore it might uh, vary together with the stated preferences, and this might be the reason why this might be consistency. So the basic conclusion from this study is that I'm not going to maybe to read them all through, but the basic conclusion is the answer that I gave also from the beginning. Even though there exists a core of organic lovers, remember column two in the Latin class model is about 30% in the case of chicken and about 20% in the case of carrot. So these people do exist. Uh, there are other attributes that consumers seem to appreciate more specifically environmentally friendly production in the case of chicken and low chemicals in the case of carrots. If you haven't seen this, I didn't show you the results of carrots due to time constraint. You have to trust me on that. Um, quality is the attribute which is most appreciated for both products. So even though we have this group of organic lovers, in fact, the attribute that uh, most people seem to appreciate most in both products is a higher quality. And we, we think that the fact that we have also review data from the same consumer is an advancement and is a type of validation for the results, even though we have to bear in mind the constraint that I have mentioned before.